We thank you for joining us this morning as we continue our series on Jesus' seven letters to the seven churches. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2 this morning, starting in verse 12. Jesus begins the letter like this, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Jesus starts his letter off much like he begins the other letters by giving the church some encouragement for the things that they were doing right. He points, off right off the, points out right off the bat that he knows the situation that these Christians in the church in Pergamum are living in. He says, you're living in the city where Satan lives and where Satan has his throne. If we had to go back and compare the ancient city of Pergamum with the modern city in the United States that we would all be familiar with, it would probably be the city of Hollywood. Like, like Hollywood, Pergamum wasn't a very uh, important city when it came to politics or when it came to commerce or anything else, but they were a very important city when it came to cultural influence. And the reason was this. They were on the cutting edge of technology for entertainment purposes in their day and age. About 200 years before Christ, it was the people of Pergamum that had founded or invented what we call paper. They, they'd invented parchment paper. And because they'd done this, they sought to kind of boost their local, uh, their local town to be known as, as, a, as a city where people could come and learn things. A city of enlightenment. We would call it a city where you'd become woke nowadays. Well, what they did is they sought to have a huge library with this, uh, with this paper. And they did. They had the second largest library in the world at the time of Jesus. Had around 200,000 scrolls. Well, people would come from all over the world to read and study these scrolls, and most of them contained information about some pagan god or some pagan philosophy or some pagan thought uh, that was going on. And they would come to these cities and they would study that, and it was just kind of a bastion for, for liberalism and a bastion for everything that was uh, wrong philosophically uh, and, and, and religiously. You could in that city go and learn how to worship these pagan gods, how to practice that worship, go out in the streets, pretty much anything went uh, in Pergamum. And then you could look up on the hillside of Pergamum and amidst all the other altars and temples and shrines that were built to all these pagan false gods, there was one that kind of stood out among the rest. And it was an altar to the Greek god of Zeus, which we're pretty much all familiar with. But this particular altar looked like a throne that overlooked the city. So when Jesus writes these words, I know where you live where Satan has his throne, that would have been immediately what would have popped into the minds of the Christians and in the church there uh, in the city of Pergamum. Yet Jesus says this, despite where you live, you've remained faithful to my name. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, you have not renounced your faith in me. Antipas, we, we know from history, was a well-known Christian in that city. He became a martyr because of his faith. And how they killed him, uh, it's, just, it, it's almost difficult to talk about. They took a bronze altar, a bronze idol, that was large enough for a man to fit in. They put Antipas in this bronze altar or, or, or idol to a pagan god. They made a fire around it and they literally roasted him, slowly roasted him to death. Because of his faith in Jesus. Yet for the most part the Christians there in Pergamum didn't renounce their faith in Christ. They stayed true to it. However Jesus does have a few things against them in verses 14 and, and 15 of our text. He says nevertheless I have a few things against you. You have people, you have people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam. And who taught Bala Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have people there who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So basically what you had in the church there in Pergamum was Christians that were staying fast to Jesus, yet there were a few kind of on the fringes that were holding to the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Now, we know what the teachings of Balaam are. Uh, I'm not going to go over that in great detail, but Jesus simply points out two things in our text, idolatry and sexual immorality. They were very involved in these. When it comes to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, they're a little bit more vague. 
However, we can go back in history and we can kind of identify what they believed in and what they stood for. Let me read for you one uh, summary from a historian from this day and age. He says, the fault of the Nicolaitans is that they are following a policy of compromise solely to save themselves from trouble. Now think about that. Their whole ideology of the, the Nicolaitans was to compromise. Whatever belief they had, whatever God they happened to worship, they were willing to compromise that at the drop of a hat for convenience sake. To, to save themselves some, some trouble. They were willing to compromise their beliefs for the sake of convenience. Now, I would submit to you that that is one of the main temptations that the church faces today. That's one of the main temptations as Christians that we face in the society that we live in today. You know, if we compromise our beliefs just a little bit, it can be more convenient at times. At times, if we compromise the doctrines of God's Word just a little bit, it can make our lives more convenient at times. If we compromise our morals just a little bit and our convictions, it can make life more, more convenient. I don't know if you've ever been guilty of this, but I've certainly been, I've certainly been tempted to fall into this thing, in this thing myself. Let me use this illustration. We all know that it's a sin to lie. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus continues that on in the New Testament, always telling us to you know, tell the truth. Be honest. Our word means something. Yet how many of you have ever been tempted to tell just a little white lie because it was convenient? You know, maybe, maybe you got pulled over by an officer and you wanted to tell just a little white lie to try to get out of a speeding ticket. Or maybe you were about to get in trouble at work and, and you were tempted to tell some little white lie, compromise just a little bit on your morals, just a little bit on God's commandments to help yourself get out of trouble. Or maybe somebody comes and they ask you a question and it kind of puts you in a bind. And you don't want to be mean to them. You don't want to be rude. But how do you answer this question? Well, maybe I'll just tell a little white lie to, to maybe spare, spare their feelings. That's the slippery slope that the Nicolaitans were living on. They, they had made their house on that slippery slope. They were living in compromise. And, and the danger of this, this compromise is summed up, it can be summed up by that old saying this, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And that's what we saw see is happening here in the church at Pergamum. They were compromising their beliefs and their doctrines, and they were compromising God's word to accommodate anybody and everybody as they came in and, uh, and believed these, these different and pagan things. They weren't willing to take a strong stand for Jesus. And if you look even closer at kind of the context of, of our text, it indicates that the major problem wasn't the ones that were going out and teaching false doctrine in the church at Pergamum. Instead, it was the majority of the Christians, that was their major problem, was that the majority of the Christians who believed the truth, they weren't willing to take a firm stand, and they were always willing to compromise, just give a little bit uh, in, in the name of tolerance, or in the name of compromise. Jesus has a pretty strong message for them in verse 16. Listen to what he says. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now I want you to notice Jesus' words here. They're, they're very important. He says, I will come to you and fight against them. So he's not going to be fighting against all of them in the church. But it's still a warning to the whole church that Jesus is going to come. If they don't hurry up and repent. If they don't start doing what they're supposed to. He's going to come and it's going to be ugly for the whole church. Because they're, they're compromising and, and allowing a few to, to kind of get away with some stuff that they shouldn't have been getting away with. Here's the weapon that Jesus is using. He says he's going to come. He's going to come and he's going to fight against them with the sword of his mouth. Now you go back to the beginning of our text and see how Jesus introduced himself in verse 12. And he introduced himself as him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. We're told exactly what that is earlier on in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us that the word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. Over in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 where Paul's talking to us about spiritual warfare. Exactly what's going on here at the church in Pergamum. He refers to the word of God as this. He says the word of God is sharper. I'm sorry. He says the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So that's what Jesus is talking about. He's going to come and he's going to fight against the church with his word. Fight against these people who are leading them astray into compromise and into, into false beliefs and philosophies by standing on his word and, and doing it in evidently a pretty harsh way. Now, 
I'll be honest, I don't know exactly what Jesus is talking about here when he says he's going to come and he's going to do this. But I do get that he's calling us to do it first. He's calling us to repent, us to be the ones that stand up, not compromise, and, and stand up against these folks that are in the church and are spreading lies and, and, and false doctrine and, and false morals here. He's calling us to do this first. I don't know what it looks like for Jesus to come and straighten this out, but I do know what the Bible tells us to do in this regard and making sure we're doing, we're doing our part to stand up for God and His truth. It's really four parts that we read about in the Bible. You know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I just, I'll, I'll point them out to you. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to know the truth. You know, if you, if you want to know the truth, read your Bible. You know, I don't think we're spending enough time reading our Bibles. Just the simple act of sitting down, spending time alone with God, reading His Word. Spending time with other Christians, studying His Word. Whether it's in a church setting or in a home setting or whatever it is. If you want to know the Word, you've got to spend some time in it. The second thing we've got to do, we're told in the Scripture to do, is we've got to be willing to speak up. Speak up for the truth. It, it's not enough to just know the Bible and just kind of have that information there in our head. When we see somebody that's doing something wrong, the Bible tells us to go to them and show them their sin. Now, now we're not to be uh, we're not to be idiots about this thing. We're not to be you know bullies about this thing. But we're to go in an appropriate manner and and confront the sin that we see going on in the church. Now, if we see it going on in the world, yeah, we're to be a light into the world too. But he's talking specifically in the, in, in the New Testament about doing this to the church. The third thing that we're called to do is we're to teach it, preach it, live it, speak it, all that stuff, we're to do it in love. If you can't find a way to take the truth of God's Word, and when you see compromise, when you see false teaching, when you see false morals and confront it with the Word of God and confront someone in love, then you need to go back and read your Bible some more because you're not getting it yet. We're always told to speak the truth, but we're told to speak it in love. We do far more damage sometimes by speaking the truth in an unloving manner than if we just be quiet, go back and read the Bible again and, and, and focus on how Jesus did it. You know, Jesus was harsh sometimes, but they always knew that He loved them. Here he is, he's out feeding the hungry, he's healing the sick, he's taking care of people's needs. He obviously loves them, and that earned him the right to tell them the truth. Everybody knew, hey, alright, even, even though Jesus might be harsh with what he's telling us to do sometimes, he's calling up to us to do some radical change, make some radical changes in our lives. We know this man loves us because of his actions. A fourth thing that we've got to do, if we're going to stand up for the truth against compromise, is we've got to be willing to face the backlash. This happened in this culture 2,000 years ago, and it's the same thing today. It might take a, a, a little different uh, face, have a little different face to it. Today, if you're going to stand up for the truth, and you're going to point out the false doctrines and philosophies and religions and whatever, whatever name they get under today, if you're going to do this, be ready for the backlash because you're going to be slandered. You're going to be called intolerant. You're going to be called a bigot. You're going to be called homophobic. You're going to be called a racist. You're going to be called whatever the popular slur of that week is, or that month is, or that year is. You're going to be called that if you stand on the truth of God's Word. But that's alright. Jesus was, was hurled insults as He was on His way to the cross. Yet He still went. And as Christians, what He's called us to do is to pick up our cross and follow Him daily. If that means that we get some insults for standing on His Word and speaking up for it and loving people with it, hey, that's fine. Be willing to be called those things. Be willing to, you know, take those labels. And even though they, they, they aren't true, just be willing to do that because, because of the message that we're, we're called to stand up for and the truth that we're called to stand upon. Let me share with you the two blessings that Jesus says that the church in Pergamum would receive if they overcame. Now, in the context here, it's talking about overcoming sin and overcoming Satan, but very specifically overcoming this temptation to compromise the truth of God's Word. Two things. In, verses, in verse 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Two things. The first blessing is this. To, uh, to him who overcomes is the hidden manna. Now in Exodus chapter 16, we're told what manna it was. 
In the Old Testament, when the Israelites were freed from Egypt, where they'd been in slavery for over 400 years, they were wandering through the wilderness and on their way to the promised land, and they got hungry. They cried out to God, Lord, we need some food. And God caused bread to rain down from heaven, and this bread was called manna. Well, in that same chapter, Exodus 16, we're told that when the temple was built, there was a piece of furniture that was in the temple called the Ark of the Covenant. That's what, that's what Indiana Jones is still looking for. But in the Ark of the Covenant, we're told that there was to be a pot of this manna that was to be stored in there. Well, they built the temple. The pot of manna is in there with the Ark of the Covenant. However, in 600 B.C., Solomon's temple was destroyed. So nobody knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. I mean, nobody knows where, you know, where this stuff is. And what in the world happened? Well, the rabbis of Jesus' day had a legend that the prophet Jeremiah had went and he had went inside the Ark of the Covenant and he had taken that pot of manna, had went up on Mount Sinai and had hidden that manna. And that one day when the Messiah came, he would return and that hidden manna, that it would be found again. So when these Jewish people that were in this culture here in Pergamum, when, when they heard this, this phrase, to eat the hidden manna, they understood that, that they were going to be able to enjoy the blessings that the Messiah brought with him. If you think about it, isn't that kind of how Jesus describes himself? In the Gospels, he says, I am the bread of life. Even today, as Christians, we come around the Lord's table every Lord's Day, and we eat a piece of bread in remembrance of his body. There's a second blessing, though. The second blessing that we receive if we overcome is this. It's a white stone with a new name written on it. Now the white stone is pretty easy to understand. In ancient cultures when uh, either white or black stones were used to record the verdict of a jury. A uh, black stone indicated that the person was guilty and they were, they were going to be condemned. A white stone stood for innocence and it stood for freedom. As Christians, if we overcome Satan through the blood of Jesus Christ, if we overcome Satan and sin and this temptation to compromise through Jesus, then, then we get this white stone. That means that we're declared innocent by Him. We're also told that there's a new name given us. Now that new name, if you go through the Bible and look at when people were given a new name, it indicated that they had a new status in life. Go back to the Old Testament. We're familiar with a man named Abram, who was later called Abraham when he received the covenant from God. A man named Jacob was called Israel after he wrestled with God. It's, they were given a new name when they received a new status or were, were viewed in a different way by the Lord. Go to the New Testament, we see the exact same thing. A man named Saul is called Paul. A man, man named Simon is called Peter, both when they became leaders in the church. So that new name indicates that there's a new status there uh, in, in the way that God views us. So for us as Christians... When we overcome Satan through the blood of Jesus, we're, we're declared innocent. We're given that white stone, and there's a new name written on that stone. That means we've got a new status in the eyes of God. I would submit to you that that new name is, is not ours. But that new name is the one, it's the name of the one who overcame sin and who overcame death. And who overcame the grave for all of us. And from the point on that we accept his offer of salvation through faith and obedience in the Christian baptism. From that point on, we are not ours. We don't belong to ourselves. But instead, we find our true identity, we find it in him. We find our identity in Jesus Christ. And that, if we just think about those facts, that gives us all the reason in the world to stand on God's word. And to not compromise the truth to appease some false doctrine or false philosophy that we're going to be confronted with in our world. As Christians, we're always going to have this stuff that comes from the Pergamum of our society. It's filtered down to us from, from Hollywood a lot in our culture. We're always going to be tempted with this, with this stuff of compromise your doctrine, compromise your morals, compromise your beliefs, compromise God's word. There's no future in it. There might be a little bit of ease right now, but there's no future in it. There's a future in standing firm on God's Word, standing up for its truth. There's a new name, and it's written on a white stone of innocence for you, if you're willing to stand up for Him. God bless you. 
Good morning, Gold Point family and junior church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on the idea of the fruit of the Spirit. We've looked at a lot of different of the, uh, of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And this week, we're going to look at another special fruit. Before we get started, we're going to play a game like we have been the last little while. And the game this week is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be, it's called Float or Sink. We're going to take these different fruits here, put it in water, and you're going to tell me if you think that the fruit's going to float or if you think the fruit's going to sink. So stay with us as we get ready to, um, to, to try these experiments and see how I many we can get right. So guys, we're about to start our game. Before, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at trying to guess these, these different, uh, of what fruit it actually is. And so this morning, we're actually going to play sink or float. The way we're going to play this is each one of these fruits are going to get placed in this water. As it gets placed in this water, it's either going to sink to the bottom or it's going to float to the top. And so, we got an apple, we have kiwi, we have a pear, we have an orange without its peeling, we have a banana, and we also have the orange with the peeling. So we're going to see which, which ones of these fruits float and which ones of these, float, uh, which ones of these fruits sink. And so we're going to go ahead and start off with the banana. How many of you think that the banana is going to float? Here we go. We're going to put the banana in the water. The banana is actually floating. The banana, even though it's kind of heavy, it still floats. That's so cool. Did you guess that the banana would float? Good job. Let's go with the kiwi. Kiwi. We're going to see if the kiwi can float. Do you think it can float? Let's try. So we put the kiwi in there. Oh, the kiwi sinks to the bottom. Sinks to the bottom. Did you guess that the kiwi would sink to the bottom? So we have, so we're going to put them different. So we have bananas float. We have kiwi sinks. How about a pear? What do you think a pear would do? It's kind of heavy. Let's see. If we put the pear in the water, The pear seems to be um, sinking. The pear seems to be sinking. So, we're going to put the pear over here with the kiwi. How about an apple? Do you think the apple will float? Or do you think it will sink? Let's put it in there and try it. What do you think? An apple floats. The apple is floating to the top. Even though an apple is kind of heavy, it still floats to the top. So we're going to put that over here with the banana. So right now, we're two and two. What do you think about a peel? Uh, actually, let's go with a peeled orange. Do you think a peeled orange will float or do you think it will sink? A peeled orange sinks. It sinks to the bottom. That's crazy. Did you think it would sink? We're going to put the peeled orange over there. How about an unpeeled orange? Do you think that this will also sink? That one did just because, you know, because of it, it being an orange. I think it's going to sink. Let's see. An unpeeled orange floats. An unpeeled orange floats. That is crazy. What did you think? Did you think it would float? That is awesome. Well, we have seen where an orange, an apple, and a banana all float. But then a pear, a kiwi, and a, and, a, and a peeled orange, they sink. How many of these did you get right? Look, I hope you all enjoyed this little, this little uh, experiment that we did. Uh, stay tuned, and we're going to get ready to start with our lesson time. Guys, y'all did a great job on that game, and I'm so glad that we were able to play and see which fruits float and which fruits sing. Thank y'all for playing, and I hope you got a lot of those right. As we get ready to start with our second to last uh, fruit of the Spirit, let's look at what this fruit is. It's actually the fruit of gentleness. This fruit of gentleness. Have you ever had something where, 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 where maybe you had a glass, and this, gla this glass had juice in it or water or... And what does your parents sometimes say? Be gentle. You don't want to break the glass. Or maybe you got a new baby, a uh, boy or girl or sister or brother or uh, someone that, that, that says that you can hold their baby and you got to hold it and you got to hold it what? 
real gentle. Because if you hold it real gent, if you don't hold it real gentle, you could hurt the baby. And so there's a lot of times when your parents have maybe told you, be gentle or be cautious or, or whatever it may be because they don't want you to hurt whatever it is that you're holding. Maybe a glass or a baby or it could be so many other things. Maybe it's your toys even that you've broken a couple of your toys and your parents may tell you, you need to be more gentle. And so as we look at gentleness this morning, we're going to look in Philippians 4, uh, looking at uh, chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. And it says this, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. You see, when he says rejoice twice, he's giving, uh, that that's the main thing that we need to, that we need to do is rejoice. And so it says rejoice in the Lord always. Always, meaning, meaning not only when good things are happening, not, not only when, when you want to, but in all ways. Even when bad things happen in your life, rejoice. There are things that even if, even if you're not rejoicing in those certain things, there's always something to rejoice in. And it says this, I will say it again, rejoice. This week, there's going to be some times in your life when you don't want to rejoice. But the Bible says, and our lives should show that we, we rejoice even when bad things happen because of who God and Christ are. Verse 5 says this, and this is so important. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And so this is, this is even the idea of someone, if someone makes you mad, show them gentleness. When, when something may happen, when you bump your head on something, or, or maybe you stub your toe on, on the door or on the table, or maybe it's the idea that, that, you, that, you, uh, that you stepped on one of your toys and it hurt your foot. Be gentle. What are some things that we can say that are more gentle and maybe, maybe not make the other person mad? Or maybe it's the idea of saying things that are gentle and the fact that, that we're trying to, to, even if they make us mad, not to make them mad. And so this idea of being gentle is also the ways that we can speak, but also the ways we can show through our actions. This one sometimes I get a little bit of trouble in because if I, if I stub my toe on something, I want to hit it back, even though it doesn't even feel the, the pain of me, of me hitting it back in whatever way I do. That's something I try to work on, is when I'm walking and I hit my head on the cabinet or something like that, it hurts. And so my first reaction is wanting to hurt it back. But in this passage, it says to be gentle. And it says this, gentle to be evident to all, that people see that your actions are gentle, but not only your actions. But the words you say are gentle to be. Because why? The Lord is near. The Lord is everywhere. The Lord sees everything that we do. And as he sees what we do, it's important that our actions and our words are gentle. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't, don't, don't worry about anything. And it says this. Don't, don't be concerned. Don't, don't, don't keep your mind up at night. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, by praying to God and letting him know these things that are going on in your life, he wants you to talk to him and he wants to talk to you. And this petition, this idea of telling him what's going on, these things that are, that are happening in your life. And it says, with thanksgiving, being grateful, being thankful for what God does in your life. Present your request to God. You see, now, now I... I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you pray for something, God's going to do it for you. Or, 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 or that if you pray for this one thing, that you're going to get it. There's, there's sometimes in life where we ask God for things, and He may do the opposite. Or He may say the opposite. Or He may, he may not do what we want Him to do. But let me show you so important in this next verse of why it's so important to, if you ask for something and God doesn't do the way you want him to, or, or, or the way that you, you think that God should answer this prayer, th this idea of, of you thinking that you know best of what God should do, but yet God knows so much more than we do. Look at this, verse 7. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, it says, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me explain a little bit. So, so when we pray to God and we're like, God, can you help me with this? Or can you, can you do that? Can you help me in this situation? Or whatever it may be. There are some times where God may be like, 
um, I'm going to help you, but I'm going to help you in a different way than what you think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help provide for you, but it may not be the same way that you think he's going to provide. But check this out. Which transcends all understanding. There are some times where we don't know the answer. Have you ever asked your parents, why is grass green? Or have you asked your parents, why this or, or why that? And sometimes your parents may say, because it is. Or because I said so. Or because I think that's the best thing. There are some times... When, when we as adults or, or your mom or dad or your grandparents may not know, but yet, which transcends all understanding, God knows all things. And then he says this, he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, even though God may not do the things we want him to do or, or answer the prayers like we want him to, check this out, he will guard your hearts and your minds. He knows what's best for you. He knows the plans and the things that He has in store for you. And there's sometimes when we pray things and He doesn't answer it the same way that we expect Him to answer it. But yet He knows all things. And He's not going to do anything that He doesn't want, that God, that God's not going to do anything to, to make it to the point where, where, uh, where He's going to put you in danger or, or anything like that. Look. Will, he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Because of what Christ has done for us. Because he died on the cross and he rose from the grave. We have that certainty to know that even if God doesn't answer our prayers. This, the, the way that we think he should. We, can, we have a guarded mind and guarded heart. In Christ Jesus. Knowing that God knows the best things for us. And so things we learned this week. Even when tough times come, there's always things that we can rejoice about. Even in the situations that are tough or, or things that are going on in life, we can still rejoice in something in those situations. Number two, let our gentleness be seen by everyone. Uh, let, our, uh, let our words and also our actions be gentle and people see them. And number three, we need to remember to continue to pray. Pray for the, thing, the situations that you may be in. Pray for the things that, that you may need help with. But also we need to be praying for things like people that may have the coronavirus. So people that, that, that may be trying to figure out this school thing or, or how to be able to do this online schooling. We always need to continue to pray. And the last thing is this. For goals this week, even if someone makes you mad, let your gentleness come out of your mouths. Say kind things, say, say, say gentle things to people, and the actions that you show as well. Be gentle and kind. Number two, it's so important that we take time each day to pray. That we take time to talk to God. This week, let's continue to try to be gentle. Mm -hmm.